Thank you, Secretary Pompeo, for sitting with us. It's great to be with you. Thank you for having me on. First, let's talk about your book. There's a whole chapter telling the hard truth about the CCP. You even call Xi Jinping the most dangerous man in the world. Why? Goodness, um, this is not your uh, granddaddy's China. <laughs> This is Xi Jinping's China, mm -hmm. and they have, as you know, I was taught as a young cadet, you, your adversaries you measure by their capacity and their intentions, and we've seen the Chinese capabilities, uh, uh, big missile systems, space programs, cyber programs, uh, an enormous economy, 1.4 billion people, they have true capabilities to deliver and cause problems for not just the United States, but for the entire world. Mm -hmm. So there's the capacity. With respect to intention, I think Xi Jinping's been unbelievably clear about his objectives, global hegemony. And he has begun to work on that. And for, uh, in the United States, four decades, maybe five, we have watched the Chinese Communist Party build its economy mm -hmm. on the backs of the American worker mm -hmm. and uh, steal our intellectual property, steal our jobs, take that back work back to China, uh, build the product, dump that product so that American Western companies can't compete with them. And we've just turned the other cheek. And our, our model was, if there's more engagement, the Chinese government will begin to behave in ways that are consistent with not, not necessarily our values, but our interests, the things that really matter to the United States. Mm -hmm. And they are not doing that today. They are inside the gates here at home. Mm -hmm. And Xi Jinping presents the most existential threat from outside of the United States to the way our children and grandchildren will live here in America. One year after the war in Ukraine, the evidence shows that Xi Jinping is considering sending lethal weapons to Putin. You have met with Putin and you know this man himself as well as the men around him. Um, do you think we could have done more to deter Putin one year ago? How can we stop him right now? Well, we did. Uh, for four years in the Trump administration, we deterred Vladimir Putin. Uh, you know, he hasn't changed. I did spend time with him. He has always believed that the the greatest sin of the last century was the dissolution of the Soviet Union. His intention to take back greater Europe, greater Russia, um, or greater Russia from Europe, uh, has always been clear. And it's just a matter of what's his perception of risk. And you know, he took a fifth of Ukraine under President Obama. Mm -hmm. For four years, he didn't take an inch, nor did he threaten to take an inch of Europe. And as soon as uh, there was a new president of the United States, he began to prepare and then execute this incredible, uh, atrocious, uh, unprovoked attack on Europe. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, uh, there more could have been done to stop him. We, we had done it. We'd made clear there would be real costs for bad behavior from the Russians. I could go through a list of things that we did. Uh, I think his perception of risk changed when President Biden came into office and he began to move on Europe. I found there, is, there are a lot of exciting inside story about North Korea in your <laughs> book. Uh, <laughs> I spent a lot of time with uh, b both in North Korea and with the North Korean leadership. Yes, you visit the Pyongyang um, as a CIA director. You saved three American hostages and you arranged a historic summit in Singapore. And you even revealed in a recent interview that you believe it was China who stepped in and kill the deal uh, in the second summit in Hanoi. Can you tell us more about your meetings with Kim Jong-un and what he said about China? <laughs> oh goodness, yes, Daphne. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, uh, President Trump asked me to go to Pyongyang. I went there the first time on Easter weekend of 2018. I was then the CIA director. Mm -hmm. So it was a quiet mission, a, a clandestine mission. Nobody knew that we were going. Uh, it, was, it, was really quite, it was really quite something to be the first senior American in a long time mm -hmm. uh, to spend time with this new leader, this young kid who had frankly just killed an American, right? He'd held Otto Warmbier mm -hmm. uh, in detention. Otto returned home to die from his mistreatment in North Korea. This weighed on my heart terribly on that first trip. Mm -hmm. uh, President Trump wanted to meet with Chairman Kim in order to try and figure out if there was a way to convince him that life would be better for the North Korean people and get him to care about that. Uh, by giving up his nuclear weapons program. And so, uh, you know, he was, uh, he, was, he was pure evil sitting across the table from me. That was most certain. Uh, and the second trip, we had three Americans that were still in detention. Mm -hmm. And I said to Chairman Kim at the end of the day that it was my expectation and that of the president that they'd, he'd let these folks come home with me. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the story is truly remarkable. I went back to the airport mm -hmm. uh, and we didn't know the health conditions of these three. 
uh, for sure. We thought that they might have been mistreated in the same way that Otto had been mistreated. And when I, uh, uh, when I was there, I was back, I was on the airplane and watched this van drive up mm. and watch these three Americans who had done nothing wrong uh, but evangelize uh, inside of Korea. Uh, to watch them climb out of that van was deeply emotional. Even as I talk about it, uh, uh, it reminds me of uh, American power at its finest. We, we didn't pay a cent for those hostages to come home. There was no deal. We didn't trade a terrorist. We didn't give a single thing. We simply said, we, we want them back and it's in your best interest to release them. And uh, within, goodness, 45 minutes or an hour of my request, mm -hmm. uh, there they were, uh, riding on this beautiful American white over blue airplane, headed back home mm -hmm. to America and to their families. Mm -hmm. You never give an inch to those, the murderous role no, of that, America's adversary. No, 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 that's right. Look, previous secretaries had gone out with Chairman Kim mm -hmm. and they'd kind of been asked for money for landing, right? Just crazy little, little things, right? Just small things. And we were just pretty clear. No, we were there on a mission. We wanted to have a conversation. We were prepared to allow the president uh, to speak with Chairman Kim in a serious way about things that mattered to the whole world and certainly to every American. Uh, and we finally got the summit set in Singapore. It was a pretty remarkable uh, visit between the president and Chairman Kim. Uh, they came to an understanding there that laid the groundwork for negotiations that I led in the months that followed. And unfortunately, when we went to Hanoi, mm -hmm. uh, it all fell apart. Uh, and I, I write about this in the book. What, what we knew, but I think we didn't know the, the scale of this, was that Sh Chairman Kim's degrees of freedom were much less than we had thought. Mm -hmm. uh, each time I would meet with him, or before the summits with President Trump, he would talk to Xi Jinping, uh, you know, get instructions at the front end, report back after the meetings, Chairman Kim made very clear in a couple of very telling moments uh, that you know, he wasn't worried about American soldiers on the Korean Peninsula. Mm -hmm. Xi Jinping was worried about soldiers, American soldiers on the Korean Peninsula. He was, in that sense, uh, very beholden to, maybe not perfect agency, Xi Jinping probably doesn't control everything, but food, shelter, security issues, lots of the contraband that moves into North Korea comes across those bridges on the north side, mm -hmm. uh, the border between China and North Korea. And so Chairman Kim is clearly being directed by the same person that we just spoke about who is trying to undermine our way of lives. Kim Jong-un, Putin, Xi Jinping, and you even dealt with the Iranian terrorist general Soleimani. If you have to pick just one, who do you think is the toughest opponent and the biggest threat to America you're fighting Yeah, for? it would be General Secretary Xi in China. Mm -hmm. uh, he is uh, dead-eyed, he is clear. He is serious. Uh, he understands the levers of power. He also understands the challenges that China has. He understands their demographic challenges, mm -hmm. all of the things that put his political power at risk. But he's now been essentially declared chairman for life uh, and has a lot of scope to, uh, to do the things that he is intent upon, including mm -hmm. bring Taiwan into the political fold of China. We'll talk about Taiwan later, but speaking of the China threat, we, we know that U.S. government and the Congress have been talking about China threat for years. But correct me if I'm wrong, for American, general Americans, um, public Americans, I think the COVID outbreak three years ago and the balloon incident just happened <laughs> recently is the two, probably the mo two most scary and tangible threat from the CCP. Can we talk about um, the COVID origin probes, if you can. Yeah. Um, tell us, what do you know about those possible leaks from the Wuhan lab, according to the evidence and intelligence you had seen? Yeah, no, you're quite right. Um, these were touch points for the American people. Yeah, because uh, you can see the balloon up in yeah, the sky. Yeah, you can, yes, exactly. More than one million Americans yes, died and, for and, COVID. And you may have lost your job. You may have lost a loved one. Yes, all of those things are true. You certainly had your kids who were in school, couldn't go to school. This impacted just about every one of us in a very material way. Uh, so I, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. um, and we also, the, we, we in the Trump administration, myself, Ambassador O'Brien, we were pretty direct. We were speaking to the American people, mm -hmm. not about some faraway problem in China, but about China and the Chinese Communist Party inside the gates here at home. And the, the virus, the Wuhan virus, was the perfect exemplar of the fact that they just don't care about human dignity or mm -hmm. human life. Uh, the Chinese leadership knew in the fall of 2019, that seems like a long time ago now, it's three years on, uh, they knew they had a problem. They knew that they had a lab leak. There had been doctors get sick uh, and have to go to the hospital for this virus uh, they, from the lab, researchers from the lab. Uh, they, they knew that this was a relatively lethal virus, 
uh, and a relatively contagious virus. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't know exactly what they had on their hands, but they knew enough to make sure that people from Wuhan didn't travel inside of China. Mm -hmm. And then they sent people from Wuhan on airplanes to all across the world, uh, unleashing this virus on all of us. Uh, you know, there's been contention about whether this was from the lab or the wet market. Mm -hmm. For parts of this, it doesn't matter, right? The fact that he sent this virus around the world, it doesn't matter where it came from. Mm -hmm. But the origin does matter in two material ways. Mm -hmm. First, that lab's still open. We, we, we're sitting here today, and the Wuhan Institute of Virology is probably no safer today than it was in the fall of 19 when they released this virus out of that facility, or the virus was released. It wasn't an intentional release. It was an accidental lab leak. That's almost certain. Uh, second, mm -hmm. um, the, the decisions that the leadership in China made following their awareness of the fact that this virus had leaked from the lab mm -hmm. uh, have, to be, have to be reckoned with. We have to account for that. We have to understand that the leader, Xi Jinping, didn't care enough about uh, some young kid living in Nebraska. He didn't care about an, an older woman who's living in Massachusetts. He didn't care about anyone except for to make sure that, this, this, that he wasn't going to be held responsible. So he obfuscated, he hid the data, he tore it all up, he uh, disappeared people so that the world wouldn't know. And of course now we do. Mm -hmm. And I, I pray that this administration, and frankly every country in the world, will begin to hold the Chinese Communist Party accountable mm -hmm. for what they, what they wrought upon this country mm -hmm. for years and years and years. Secretary, what do you make of the China balloon incident? Did you ever hear such incident when you, when you were Secretary of State or CIA Director? Yeah, no, of course not. Uh, this was what happened was mm -hmm. fundamentally different than anything that had happened before. There had never been a balloon of this size transiting slowly across the continental United States with the capacity to stare down at some of our most sensitive military facilities. I know the Biden administration has suggested somehow this happened before. Mm -hmm. They were good enough to brief me, Ambassador Bryan, Director Ratcliffe, on uh, what they knew about that. Uh, and while I can't t say everything about that briefing, this, is, this was different. And, mm -hmm. and President Biden didn't understand what the world would see when this balloon mm -hmm. came across America. He saw in America allowing the Chinese Communist Party to violate our sovereignty for five days, and he did nothing. Uh, that's just an enormous mistake. The risk trade-off, I understand, they're worried about falling debris. I think they could have done this in a way that would have been very, very safe and we wouldn't have watched the whole world let the Chinese Communist Party conduct espionage. Mm -hmm. And I don't even just mean the cameras that were on the balloon. I've, I understand they say, well, they had them turned off. They mm -hmm. couldn't transmit. If, if, assuming that that was true, you still watch them testing our air defenses, mm -hmm. testing the political and media responses to this kind of thing, right? The, Xi Jinping's putting all of this in his calculus as he thinks about uh, expanding in the South China Sea, as he thinks about uh, stealing resources from Africa, as he, as he thinks about Taiwan, mm -hmm. he's, he's evaluating what, how are Americans responding to very real visible threats to their own homeland. And if he mm -hmm. sees the reaction he saw from President Biden, I'm afraid he'll see this as a green light to continue his aggression. Taiwan being called as the most dangerous place on earth, you know, has been in the headline recently, especially after Putin's invasion of Ukraine. The Wall Street Journal reported that U.S. will send more troops to Taiwan and State Department just approved a new arms sale to Taiwan, including missiles to uh, their F-16 fleet. So what do you think that we can do to deter Xi Jinping's ambition to take over Taiwan, especially when many experts predict the PLA will attack Taiwan by the year 2027. So there's many things we can do. Mm -hmm. I applaud those decisions by the Biden administration. I don't do politics when it comes to national security. Mm -hmm. When they get it, when I think they've got it wrong, I'll say it, when they get it right, I'm happy they're gonna send more trainers. I'm happy they're gonna send increased levels of armaments. Those are good things. We should do more of each of those. We should, we should help the Taiwanese in a way the Biden administration refused to help the Ukrainians in anticipation of a conflict with a bad guy. Uh, they just asked for our stuff mm -hmm. and our help in them being able to effectively use that stuff. We should, now is the time to do that. Second, mm -hmm. alliances in the region will matter. Uh, they'll matter for two reasons. One, they'll be prepared in the event that Xi Jinping does something stupid. Mm -hmm. um, but more importantly, when Xi Jinping sees Australia, mm -hmm. Japan, uh, the Republic of Korea, uh, all of these nations joining together, the Philippines, training, preparing, working alongside the Taiwanese governments to prepare for such an event, 
this will increase the likelihood that he'll think twice before he actually does. So this is the quintessential model uh, that the Trump administration had of deterrence. Be ready, build friends, mm -hmm. get out in front of this risk. Uh, so I hope they'll do that last. The United States needs to continue to make sure we have an industrial base capable of providing the, the systems that will be needed. We've watched in Ukraine, you know, there's some idea that there may not be enough artillery rounds, there won't be enough missiles, that our stockpiles, uh, not just our, the German stockpiles, the mm -hmm. Uh, French stockpiles that will be depleted. We need to make sure that resources are put in place so that we can help all of our friends mm -hmm. not fight the war. Uh, we need to help them fight, the, uh, help them prepare for that fight in a way that makes sure we never have to actually deal with the conflict. Secretary, you canceled the Taiwan contact guidelines in 2021. Yes, at the very end of my time. <laughs> many Taiwanese diplomats really appreciate what you did and you been urging the United States to grant the full diplomatic recognition to Taiwan. And you visited Taiwan yourself. <laughs> I've you know, now been twice, Last yes, year yes. and met with President Tsai Ing-wen. I've heard that she's planning to visit the United States this year. If you get a chance, will you invite President Tsai Ing-wen to come to visit or give a speech at the Hudson Institute in Washington, D.C.? Do you think it's a good idea? I think it'd be fantastic. Uh, all of the things that we did, and I, it took me too long to make that decision at the State Department. I regret I didn't do that a year earlier. Uh, there's an enormous bureaucracy, a history uh, with respect to Taiwan. There was a set of understandings, but there, that status quo was voided, not by us, but by Xi Jinping. He's, he's the one who upset that, 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 that balance that had been struck. And what we failed to do in the West, in the United States in particular, was say, look, you, you broke the deal, fair enough, we're going to go back and we're going to reconstruct this. And so systems, capabilities, tools, we should be very clear, Taiwan is an independent nation, right? This mushy middle place that it finds itself today is really risky, not just for them, but for their neighbors and for the United States. I, I, don't, think of, I don't think of Taiwan as a foreign policy problem either. Mm -hmm. Think of it as a deeply domestic U.S. issue. We, we have 15 TSMC semiconductors sitting within 50 yards of where we physically are right now. Uh, that is a very important economic element of what it is that Xi Jinping is pursuing with the, his effort to bring Taiwan back under. Mm -hmm. And it's important to the rest of the world too. If that facility were to no longer be able to deliver its semiconductors to the United States, mm -hmm. uh, we'd have lots of commercial problems, but we'd have problems for our national security systems as well. And we mm -hmm. can't let that happen. And we have the ability to deter Xi Jinping. We simply need to get after it. According to your book, Hong Kong remains yet another area of unfinished business. And you said the failure to do more to protect freedom for the people of Hong Kong remains among your most bitter memories. What could you have done more for Hong Kong? It breaks my heart mm -hmm. uh, that this happened on my watch. Mm -hmm. uh, there were a whole handful of things we could have done, uh, whether it was with Cardinal Zen or Jimmy Lai, mm -hmm. or the judicial systems there, or providing uh, even moral support to the freedom fighters there in Hong Kong who wanted nothing more than the status quo. They weren't asking for independence. They were, they were simply saying, we've had, this, we've had this great place in Hong Kong and had this special set of rules. It was different. Economics flourished. It was good for mainland China, too. And yet Xi Jinping couldn't tolerate that freedom. He couldn't permit that to happen. And uh, there were many things I think we could have done. And uh, for a host of reasons, we didn't. Uh, and I'm not sure in the end, Daphne, if it would have changed anything. I don't know. I can't predict. Had we done more, would we have been able to convince Xi Jinping not to in place the national security law there, undermine the court systems, uh, basically coerce the political leadership of Hong Kong to do his bidding? Uh, but we could have reduced the chances that would have happened, and it, it saddens me for it saddens me for the people of Hong Kong. But mostly, it saddens me because this was good for the United States as well. Mm -hmm. Secretary, you have also equated the CCP's genocide in Xinjiang with Nazi Holocaust. Um, given China's behavior both at home and abroad, do you think it is? following the path of Nazi Germany to pose a global threat, not only to the U.S., you said that global hegemony, a global threat, in your opinion. It's very different. I, I, haven't, made, I haven't made that analogy mm -hmm. uh, directly. Um, what's going on in Xinjiang uh, looks and feels like the treatment that happened to large numbers of people in Nazi Germany. That is a true statement, mm -hmm. uh, but it's fundamentally different. In, in some ways, 
uh, a greater threat to the world. Mm -hmm. A greater threat in the following way. We, we should never forget, I, I have people say all the time, Mike, you're spoiling for World War III. No, in fact, I'm trying to make sure that World War III doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. But I'm also not naive. Uh, the Chinese have been engaged in economic warfare with the United States and Europe for decades. And so people say, Mike, we don't want another Cold War. Well, you sometimes have to play the hand that you dealt. Xi Jinping's a different cat. He is not like his predecessors. And he is engaged in what, for, from his perspective, is a war that is preparing for an even greater conflict. Mm -hmm. And that starts with ec economics, starts with propaganda and diplomacy. You know, we closed the largest spy operation ever conducted inside the United States, that the Chinese government was operating out of its uh, consulate, its diplomatic facility in Houston, Texas. Think about that. Mm -hmm. Chinese spies in our, in our country operating out of a diplomatic facility. And the U.S. government had known this and did nothing until we came along. Uh, we shut it down. We set the program back a number of years. This is the scale and magnitude of the effort of Xi Jinping. Mm -hmm. And we just all have to acknowledge it. They're, they're not 10 feet tall. They're, we're going to win. We're gonna, the, the, the West will prevail, but it is going to take determined, thoughtful leadership to get this right. And I pray that in America, this will be bipartisan. And this isn't about left or right. This is about American sovereignty. It is about basic respect for human dignity, property rights, the capacity to trade, right? We, we, let, the, we let the Chinese Communist Party uh, still operate as a developing nation inside the World Trade Organization. I mean, this is just nutty. And so uh, we, we have to recognize the facts as they are with China, not as we wish them to be. And when we do that, I'm convinced that a different, a different kind of leadership will evolve inside of China. Mm -hmm. And that'll be good for us. It'll be good for the 900 million billion Chinese people who don't want anything to do with what Xi Jinping is doing either. How did the U.S.-China policy transform under the Trump administration? Why do you think the engagement has been a failure over the past decades? Oh goodness, it's hard to know uh, why it was a failure. Mm -hmm. uh, and never give an inch. I, I, I talk about that a little bit, but I mostly say it has been a failure. And so here are the things that we need to do. Uh, I, think, I think in the end, um, we hoped for too much with engagement. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, what we could have re realistically expected is that they would behave outside of their country in a way that was consistent with the things we asked Norway to do, the things we asked other, every other country, the Australians to do, the things we asked the uh, Malaysians to do. They didn't do that. Uh, to expect that engagement was going to cha fundamentally transform China inside of China was too much. Mm -hmm. And I think the fact that we had that hope uh, caused us to be too, um, too indirect in our focus, and the result is... Uh, it's clear that the engagement model didn't deliver the most primary outcome, the outcome that matters to the American people every day. Secretary, you have been sanctioned by China, Russia, and Iran. You were even targeted in an assassination plot. What's your take on being sanctioned and targeted by those countries? <laughs> you know, um, I think the most important thing about the sanctions regime against me is not about me. They are sending a message to my successor and others in the United States government. So when you, when you sanction Mike Pompeo, he can't travel to China or he can't travel to Russia. So, so be it. Um, but I think what they're saying is, hey, if you, all, if you all defend America, if you all protect American sovereignty, if you'll do the things that Mike Pompeo did, you'll, you'll be sanctioned too. And a, a lot of folks made a lot of money, Daphne. Uh, doing business with China that are now serving inside the United States government and I think they're sending a message to them don't do what Pompeo did because if you do when you leave government you won't be able to make the living the way you did so I think that was I think that's the most salient thing is they were they were sending a strong signal about uh, how American government officials should behave and saying don't don't do it the way that Mike did mm, you are on CCP's sanction list but at the same time, your photos on Twitter, including your dog versus toy, <laughs> your famous Winnie the Pooh coffee <laughs> mug, and you're helping Susan with um, the dishes, doing the dishes in the kitchen. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, it yeah. all went viral, you know, um, inspired a lot of uh, yeah. Chinese. You were hated by um, the CCP, but, you know, supported by Chinese people. In yeah. the end of this book, you even mentioned that you got a note from a Chinese-American couple who named yeah. their son Pompeo. It's crazy. Uh, the note's in there. Uh, it's a wonderful story, someone naming themselves after me. It's just, just so, what a blessing for, mm -hmm. for me. Uh, 
I love the Chinese people. <laughs> uh, they're, they're good people. They want to take care of their families. They want to live their lives. They want their children to have more opportunity than they had. Uh, instead, the Chinese Communist Party crushes them. It's a surveillance state. Uh, they put some of them in prison. They can't practice their faith in the way that they want to. It, it destroys the very humanity of the Chinese people. And so I pray that uh, the Chinese Communist Party uh, will no longer be able to do that one day. Mm -hmm. uh, and that the Chinese people will get a government that respects them and treats them the way that they ought to be treated and deserved. And that'll be great for them, but it's great for the world too. Mm -hmm. I always am mindful. We, we talked about America first in the Trump administration. I'm always mindful how much that ends up mattering to the United States. Mm -hmm. um, Chinese people being able to feed themselves will buy American agriculture from my home state of Kansas. Mm -hmm. uh, Chinese people who are successful in business uh, will consume American technology. So uh, they'll, they'll make relationships and friendships with the people of the United States and of Germany and of Poland. Those are really good things for America, wholly apart from the fact that the lives of these Chinese people would be better too. I, 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 I believe one day we'll get there. We're, we're going to go through a lot, of, uh, a lot of challenges to get to that place, but I, I'm convinced. I, uh, I, I saw some data last night uh, that the, the, the birth rate in China declined by 40% over the last six or seven years. Think about what that says about Chinese moms and dads, mm -hmm. that they've decided they don't have enough confidence in their own country to raise families. That is, a, that is a black mark on the Chinese leadership and the absence of confidence in the future for that country. And I hope that America can be a part of making their lives better as a result of getting things right for our country as well. And now you are doing this special program at the Hudson Institute called Evening Chats with Mike Pompeo. <laughs> and with the first episode title, the CCP does not represent the Chinese people. Why do you want to talk to Chinese people directly through this program? Yeah, it, it, by the way, drove the leadership there crazy. Mm -hmm. Because the one thing, if you're Xi Jinping, you can't tolerate is your people knowing what it is you're doing to them. And so I wanted to share with them what, uh, what America is trying to do to help them, mm -hmm. uh, the things their leadership is trying to do that absolutely harm them. And uh, it's difficult because there's an information blackout in good parts of China. Mm -hmm. They can't see all of the world and what's really going on in there, being fed propaganda uh, on their, in the Chinese social media and in uh, uh, networks and television. Uh, I wanted them to hear from just one American who had the privilege to serve as Secretary of State about the things that uh, they can hope for and expect. You built a foreign policy based on President Ronald Reagan's simple principle, peace through strength. I'm wondering that, uh, did your military background at the West Point and the Army affect your policy making? Yeah, I think probably did. Uh, I was a young soldier mm -hmm. when uh, the Cold War ended. I was in a tank platoon in Germany from 1986 to 1989, and you're too young. But this was a tense time in the world, and the uh, Soviet Union was causing problems all across the world in the same way Xi Jinping is trying to do today. Mm -hmm. uh, and I watched President Reagan, he was my commander in chief when I was a lieutenant, and I watched him arm the military, do the deterrence, allow us to train all the things that can deter aggression. I, I saw him emanate as a leader of America, that idea that America was going to take care of itself and be strong in the world and lead. And uh, it was the model that we adapted. Uh, you know, the book's called Never Give an Inch. And I was a diplomat. And so we always have places that one can compromise. But in the end, the things that really matter, there's just no room to give. And uh, America as the most exceptional nation in the world is one of those. We simply, there's no reason for us to apologize or give an inch. Mm -hmm. We should fight for that. It's worth it. President Trump called you my mic. Uh, to me, it's a relatively better nickname if you compare to all the others, right? Yeah, Daphne, I think that's true. But yeah. we, also, we have also heard some people calling you his yes man. What do you say to those critics? Yeah, no, I've heard that. And by the way, if we end up in a presidential campaign, I'm sure I'll get a new nickname and we can all, we can all speculate about what that might be. Uh, I, I, I was loyal to America. This is your job. You raise your right hand. You swear an oath to America's Constitution to defend it. And I knew to do my job well, the whole world needed to perceive me as speaking on behalf of the United States and of President Trump. That was, that was the entry mark. 
Uh, and so you, you can go track it for four years, CIA director and secretary of state. Uh, you can't find much gap between President Trump and me in our, my public statements. Uh, but make no mistake about it, when I thought the president was getting it wrong, right? There were days he wanted to pull out of Afghanistan, and we just weren't a place to do it. Uh, he, he didn't want to provide the defensive weapon systems in Ukraine the same way that I thought made good sense. Uh, I would tell him that. I'd explain why I thought that. And then he was the president of the United States, and I would do my level best to make sure that we executed what it was he asked us to do. Why did you tweet 1,384 days on the very <laughs> first day of the Biden presidency while we're all coming down to the next presidential election day next year? What's your plan? Are you running for the next president? I don't know yet. We're thinking, we're praying. We, my wife Susan and me, are thinking, we're praying, we're trying to figure our way through this. In, uh, in, in a couple of months, we will have done that and everyone will know the answer to that question, including Susan and me. Okay. Thank you so very Daphne, much, Secretary you. Pompeo. You know, my pleasure talking to you. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank, Thank you. you. It was a privilege. Thank, Thank you, you very much.